والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Indeed all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of the universe and all within and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. On Monday, we talked about the reality of the Prophet والسلام, that in as much as on the one hand, he was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from mistakes or from forgetting parts of the message that Allah had revealed to him and this of course is also the case for all prophets and messengers and it is to ensure the integrity of the message on the other hand also the Prophet ﷺ was also a human being and this is where his greatness really lies in the fact that he's a human being facing the same challenges that the people face and still be able to display a very high level of character and behavior. Now, what I would like to do today is to extend that issue a little bit and to talk a little bit about what exactly is the Sunnah. Because sometimes a person who does not or is not able to differentiate between what the Prophet ﷺ did in terms of explaining religion to us and what he did as a human being, you can be confused. So it is important for us to understand what exactly the Sunnah is. Now, we agree that the Prophet ﷺ, or we should agree at least, is a human being. Human being in all respects. So he's not part human, part angel, or part human, part divine. He's completely a human being. And it is the nature of human beings to have certain likes and dislikes, or personal likes and dislikes that we grow up with. And you know what's amazing? That even if you take siblings who are brought up in the same home with the same parents, and so everybody exposed Everybody is exposed, all the siblings, all the children in the home, to the same things that the parents do. You know, the same kind of food that they all uh, eat. It's not like uh, their, their mom cooks one, one type of rice for one of them, another different type for another one. It's the same rice. And yet, subhanAllah, often these same siblings grow up with their own personal likes and dislikes, even in these things such as food and so on. I have some brothers, any time of the day you offer them tea, they will drink. They never refuse tea. But I, personally, only drink tea sometimes at breakfast time. And here and there, sometimes you have a, a gathering, you attend a gathering, I may drink tea. But generally, no. So I'm always amazed at this, that, that even brothers and sisters, siblings, who are raised in the same home, they have their own personal likes and dislikes. And of course, many things are similar as well. So this is the nature of every human being. We have our personal likes and dislikes. And the Prophet والسلام, was no different. Even after he was commissioned as a messenger of Allah, that does not mean that suddenly he had no more personal likes and dislikes. And we need to be able to understand this and to differentiate between what is sunnah and what might have been done as a personal like of the Prophet ﷺ. So first of all, as human beings, we have our own personal likes and dislikes. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ, from the time he was commissioned as a messenger of Allah, now he had a duty to inform people about religion, about what Allah expects or wants from them. So everything and anything he did or said in order to explain, or approved by the way, 
in, in order to approve or explain what Allah wants from us and how Allah wants it from us, this is what is known as the Sunnah. Anything he did or said or approved, because in the definition of the term Sunnah in the view of the Fuqaha, Sunnah is that which has some relation with the deen or connection with the deen with religion. If it has no connection to religion, it's not considered sunnah. And it is defined as the, the sayings, the actions, and the approvals of the Prophet ﷺ. Because these are the things that are related to religion. <coughs> but if it has no relation with religion, it, it is not called sunnah. Which means that people in this area, you have, mashallah, your flexibility. Let me give you an example. Once the Prophet ﷺ passed by some people who had a garden with date palms. And these people were pollinating the date palms themselves, manually. And the Prophet ﷺ said to them, wouldn't it be better if you leave it so that it is done naturally? by the bees and the people decided to leave it let it be done naturally I mean anybody a messenger of Allah tells you something or makes a suggestion chances are we would listen so they stopped what they were doing and left the date palms by themselves to for the pollination to happen naturally but when the harvest time came they found that the yield was was significantly less than the years when they were doing it themselves manually so they went back to the Prophet ﷺ and they said to him O Messenger of Allah you know you suggested that we leave this pollination to be done naturally and the yield is not as great as it used to be when we do it ourselves Then the Prophet ﷺ told them that in the matters of your everyday life, you people have more knowledge, you know better what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So in matters of everyday life, based on the likes and dislikes and practices of people, what works for you, mashaAllah, do it. But in matters of religion, then we accept and we follow the advice and the suggestions and the example of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ made it clear that look, there, there are issues that are related to everyday life that are not related to, a religion, to religion in the sense that it is allowed, is it not allowed, is it wrong, is it right, halal, haram, no. The Prophet says in these matters, you do what you know works best for you. So if manually doing the pollination is better, and this is your experience, go ahead, do it. Now let me give you another example of something that has an attachment to religion. And this is a hadith also in Sahih al-Bukhari. <coughs> Once the Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu walking with the Prophet salam, saw a beautiful cloak being sold in the market. And he told the Prophet salam, why don't you buy this? A silken cloak, very beautiful, and you can wear it on these special occasions. This is the messenger of Allah. He should uh, sort of stand out if you like, or look better than everybody else. The Prophet ﷺ told him, he said, this <coughs> is for them, meaning that these believers in this world, and it is for the believers in the next world. So the Prophet did not buy it. Now sometime after this, the Prophet ﷺ received a silken shirt which he gave to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Umar radiallahu anhu said to him, and this teaches us that when we have questions, ask them. It is okay to ask questions to, for clarification. In that we should not just blindly follow. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu remember the other incident when he suggested to the Prophet to buy a particular cloak and the Prophet told him no. 
You know, that's for, for people who don't believe in this world. So he said to the Prophet ﷺ, you told me before that this thing here is not good for us to wear as Muslims, and you, you have given me one as a gift. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, I did not give you with the intention that you should wear it. You don't have to wear it. So what Umar ibn Khattab did, he gave it, he said in the hadith, to a brother of his who was a mushrik at the time. Because remember, a person who is not Muslim does not or may not subscribe to the same rules of what is allowed and what is not allowed or halal and haram as we Muslims. So it is prohibited for a Muslim to wear a silken shirt, but not for, <coughs> the Muslim may not consider that a haram per se or, prohibit, or, or, or prohibited, so they wear it. So here, in this incident, we find that this is something that has some connection with religion. And as a result, Omar ibn Khattab did not wear. He gave it away. Why? Because this is related to religion. So the basic principle is, if the issue is related to religion, then it is sunnah. If it is not, then it's simply related to, let's say, the personal likes of a person, of the Prophet it is not sunnah. Let me give you another example. When the Prophet ﷺ performed Hajj, and he made only one Hajj, on the way back from, uh, from Arafah in the evening time, before he arrived at Muzdalifa, he stopped on the way to answer the call of nature. One of the companions who were with him was Abdullah ibn Umar anhuma. After the death of the Prophet ﷺ, ibn Umar, when he performed Hajj, and he left Arafat to come back to Muzdalifa. he would stop in the exact place to go to the washroom. And the companions told him, they said, look, you know this is not sunnah, right? It's not sunnah that everybody has to go to the washroom. This is a, a, a natural human function. You have to go to the washroom. The place you go may depend on, you know, how badly you need to go or whether or not it's an appropriate place. So Ibn Omar used to do this, and he acknowledged, and he told the companions, yes, I know this is not sunnah. But nevertheless, he said, or he justified by saying, look, he would still like to do these things that the Prophet ﷺ used to do, even the places he went to. And this, of course, is a testament to the strong attachment that the Sahaba had to the Prophet ﷺ. So although Ibn Umar knew this was not sunnah per se, nevertheless, because of his strong attachment with the Prophet wasalam, he still liked to go to those places, even if it was to use the washroom where the Prophet wasalam, went. So at the end of the day, the Prophet is a human being or was a human being, and he had to do certain things as a human being. When he tells us to do it this way and not that way, <coughs> then that becomes part of religion. I mean, I'm not implying that the things we naturally do as human beings, it's not part of religion at all. Because in as much as it's natural to go to the washroom, there is a, an element of religion that is attached to that in terms of cleaning ourselves properly, because we have to come back and be in a condition to pray, in a state to pray. Uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ has taught us how to clean ourselves. He has taught us that when we are in, a, in, the, open, in the open, that we should not face the Qibla while, while uh, relieving ourselves. Uh, unlike if you're at home and you have your uh, washroom that, is, uh, that has walls around it, then the direction doesn't really matter. Um, so there is some connection to religion. The thing is though, if the Prophet, when the Prophet tells us to do it this way or to do it that way or not to do this, or to